so this evening, as we mentioned, we'll be doing chapter five of the Miller Kirti Sutra. And um, for the people, and we, in previous months, we're doing this not every month, but every few months we do a chapter from the sutra. And of course, Bimla Kirti Sutra is famous because it is not only very popular, especially uh, in East Asia and Tibet, but it's famous because it was um, specifically about a lay person written Vimla Kirti himself is a lay person, a very wealthy merchant in the city of Ashali. And so um, that's one of the things that makes it, makes it very, very popular. And it's one of the earlier Mahayana works dating to around the first century BCE. And the oldest references to it are in vernacular Indic language, although as Ichishima Sensei mentioned a few moments ago, there was a, a Sanskrit um, copy that was found in Patala Palace and his university, Taisho University, found it there and bought it uh, out and it has been translated uh, since then. Um, chapter five, let me, let me lead up a little bit. Hey, Sam. Hi. Let me lead up a little bit to just say that the previous four chapters start out um, after the first chapter, which is an introductory chapter. The next several chapters really deal with Shakyamuni Buddha uh, finding out that Vimala Kirti has been ill and that he wants to know what's going on. I mean, Vimala Kirti is a well-known lay person who teaches the Dharma and, and Shakyamuni Buddha is very impressed by him. So he goes to some of his disciples, Shariputra, to begin with, is considered one of his chief disciples, and says, well, you should go to Vashali and ask Vimla Kirti, what's wrong, why he's ill, and give my regards. And, <laughs> and, and, and Shariputra says, no, no, I, I, I'm not gonna do that. Every time I talk to this man, he tells me what a terrible disciple I am, that I don't have enough discipline, that I don't have enough knowledge about the Dharma, et cetera. Why would I do something like that? And so Shakyamuni Buddha goes step by step through many of his main disciples, his chief disciples, and they all have the same story. Well, then he goes and he asks the various bodhisattvas, such as um, Avalokitesvara, uh, and, and uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other bodhisattvas that he mentioned specifically, but many bodhisattvas, heavenly bodhisattvas, and they all have the same story. No, I can't do this. He, the fellow insults me and tells me what a terrible, what a terrible bodhisattva I am. Why should I do this? Finally, we get to chapter five. And in chapter five, he asks Manjushri, now, Manjushri, of course, is the bodhisattva that we associate with wisdom. And you'll often see him holding a sword to cut through ignorance, uh, as an example. And Manjushri, and I'm reading from the text now, Manjushri responds that the lay person, Bimla Kirti, uh, is very difficult, difficult to confront because of his profound awakening, eloquence, and supreme bodhisattva conduct. However, he will obey Buddha's august command, is the term that was used, and visit. Now, all the disciples and all the bodhisattvas, Indra, Brahma, all these people say, we're going to go. Now, I look at this and I think to myself, this is like the World Federation of Wrestling. They're going to go watch this big event, uh, you know. Watch him, watch uh, Vimla Kirti duke it out with Manjushri, so to speak. At least that's my take on it. And so they're all, and what we have, I think the number was 8,000. 8,000 beings were all going to go to Vashali. Now, 8,000 beings going to Vashali 
would be like, you know, today, 100,000 people showing up in East Chatham. You know, it's just, it's, it, it must be a real sight. Anyway, so Manjushri goes, and on hearing of Manjushri's visit, Vimler Kirti recognized, sees all these people. Now, Vimler Kirti, as I said before, is a relatively rich merchant. And so he has a relatively big house. However, he has been staying in a small little room the size of a cell with nothing except a single bed in this. There's no chairs, there's no other furniture, there's no ornamentation, just a simple bed in this small little room that would be probably, you know, two and a half meters by two and a half meters, something along that side, that size. And Vimalakirti looks and says, uh-oh, what am I going to do? And so he cleans things out of the house to make way for everyone who's coming in. Um, and we're going to de deal a little bit later with what happens in the next chapter. And I, and I think, by the way, this is one of the distinctions. Ichishima Sensei and I were just talking a moment ago between the difference between, or the, the fact that there is a difference between the Burton Watson um, translation of the uh, Vimla Kirti Sutra and Bob Thurman's. There's also several other translations. Charles Luck did a translation uh, and a number of other translations. And I think that one of the differences between those that were the Chinese translations and those that were based on the Tibetan translations is that it seems like the numbering of the chapters is a little bit different. Um, but in the next chapter is a truly magical chapter in terms of the, the, wonderfully, the wonderful things that, that um, Vimla Kirti does in, in the house, magic sorts of things that he does in the house. But we'll get to, we'll get to that later. So what, I'm in, what I'd like to do in, in this time is address some of the major questions that are posed in this chapter. And the first question uh, is addressed by Manjushri, who asked the question, what is the cause of the illness? And the first response is as follows. And this is a quote from the, uh, from the Burton version. This illness of mind is born of ignorance and feelings of attachment. Because all living beings are sick, therefore I am sick. If all living beings are relieved of sickness, then my sickness will be mended. Why? Because the bodhisattva for the sake of all living beings enters the realm of birth and death. And because he is in the realm of birth and death, he suffers illness. If living beings can gain release from illness, then the ill will, the ill will no longer be ill. It's hard to say three times fast. Um, when we look at this, one of the part of what we learn is that it's not a typical uh, physical ailment that we're dealing with here. It's not like he has cholera or the measles or COVID-19. This is an illness which afflicts all people all the time. And furthermore, he's addressing the idea in this, that the bodhisattva takes on the illnesses of others. In other words, the true bodhisattva is someone who recognizes the difficulties other people are having. And as a result, they then, uh, the bodhisattva, then in and of its, him or herself, takes on pain that's associated with other people's illnesses. So it's the, the bodhisattva cannot get well until everyone gets well. Well, that's one of the definitions or part of the definition of a bodhisattva, that the bodhisattva cannot attain complete awakening until all sentient beings attain complete awakening. And so this is a, a rather an example of that. And I think that one of the other things that's that's being stipulated in here, although I don't, I don't have it listed exactly 
here. Um, but Manjushri asks um, Bhimala Kirti specifically if his illness is of the body or if his illness is of the mind. And I don't, I don't have that here. But Vimla Kirti responds, there is no distinction. They're one and the same. That the body and the mind of the individual are, you, you can't separate them, which is, I, I think, now we look at it in a, a very different way than sort of the Cartesian method that we would have used years ago in examining something along this line. But it's really interesting that he says, well, whether one has a physical illness or a mental illness, there's no distinction. And I don't mean just mental illness as a separate characteristic of illnesses, but the mind, what the, the, the suffering that we experience through anxiety and, and through uh, other difficulties is really not distinctive from the illnesses that we experience in the body, such as having the flu. Uh, you know, just as a quick example. And then there are several points that he addresses um, when he's asked the first question, what is the cause of the illness? And here's where we go further into the notion of the illness of the bodhisattva. And I quote, this illness of mind is born of ignorance and feeling of attachment. Because all living beings are sick, therefore I am sick. If all living beings are relieved of sickness, then my sickness will be mended. Why? Because the bodhisattva, for the sake of living beings, enters the realm of birth and death, and because he's in the realm of birth and death, he suffers illness. If living beings can gain release from illness, then the ill will no longer will be ill. I just read that today. <laughs> Well, it's good to hear it again. A little later, Manjushri asked a penetrating question, and I've abridged this response. How should a bodhisattva console another bodhisattva who is sick? And Vimala Kirti responds, tell him about the impermanence of the body, but do not tell him to despise or turn away from the body. Tell him that the body is without ego, but urge him to teach and guide living beings. Tell him to use his own illness as a means of sympathizing with the illness of others, or he should understand their sufferings. And here I think it's really important to recognize that, that what he's saying in this, when he says, tell about the impermanence of the body, but do not tell him to despise or turn away from the body, is this chapter really is about, in many ways, the nature of the two truths and the, and the three truths. And that is to say that the first truth is the provisional truth. And the second truth is the absolute truth. And the provisional truth is the truth or a uh, reality of causation. Everything happens as a result of causes. Whereas the absolute is shunyata, is emptiness, that everything is void of inherent this. And then from a Tiantai perspective, we would have the middle way in which the absolute reality and the provisional reality are both one and the same and neither one and the same. They're both. And so we see in here, in this response, not the middle way, but we do see a recognition of the provisional truth and the absolute truth. Now, this chapter really deals with upaya, really deals with skillful means to a very large extent. And so in this case, telling the bodhisattva, tell him about the impermanence of the body, but do not tell him to despise or turn away from the body is upaya. It's a way of saying, yes, the body has no, um, is basically a vessel that has no inherent this that's there. On the other hand, we don't go and, and, and discuss that at great length because people aren't 
people are not ready to hear that and people don't want to listen to it. So you've got to use quite a skillful means as a mechanism to let the person better understand what is the nature of the body in this case. And further, that the without ego, that this is an opportunity to teach and guide other living beings because they're in a position where they're asking a very obvious question. I'm sorry that I'm turning my back folks. Mm. I'm looking this way. I apologize. Um, and furthermore, that you use this as an opportunity to sympathize with their illness and to understand their sufferings. I think about that literally daily in, in today's world is how we are so concerned. I, when I say we, I'm not talking about necessarily the people in this room, the people you know, that are, that are on, online, but we as a society, we as a world, are so concerned about, I'm concerned about my freedom without being concerned about the wellness of others. That's really what we're dealing with today. I think about this on a daily basis. How can you sympathize with others? In other words, the people who are so concerned about not getting vaccinations or whatever. And yeah, I'm, I'm being political here, but I don't mean it politically, I mean it from a public health sense. How can the people who are not concerned about being vaccinated, they're only concerned about their quote unquote, their freedoms, whatever that may be. The fact that, that our economy is tanking as a result of the virus, the fact that children and adults are dying as a result of this seems inconsequential compared to their freedom to wear a mask, not to wear a mask, to have a vaccine, to not have a vaccine, et cetera. This is really gets to the base of that, of that idea, to tell him to use his own illness as a means of sympathizing with the illness of others, and he should understand their suffering. What's the suffering of others? Are there any questions before I, before I continue? If I'm just talking to this group, people will <laughs> kick in all the time and say, hey, wait a second, but are there any questions anywhere, both here or out there? I say out there, I'm looking at everybody. So you're out there to me, I'm out here to you. Any questions so far? No? Okay. I'm either making a lot of sense or I'm boring you stiff. <laughs> um, so it's either can or. I, can I? Can, Please, go ahead. Go can ahead. I make a, make, make, a, make a comment? Sure. It, se it seems to me that the very, right, <laughs> I'm going back to what you commented on two truths or three truths. That Vimala Kiriti is, is having illness and is in the empty house seems to capture two aspects. Right? Empty house, I understand that in the Sanskrit edition, use the uh, 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 Shunya. So, uh, so he is in a way represent that. That itself is a symbol, a metaphor. So he is living in emptiness, but he is also living with or in illness, which is the network of dependent origination. So he, yeah. in a way, lives in those two dimensions. Yeah, and 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 you raise that. And, and that's really interesting because he does, I, I didn't include it in here, but he does, he is asked, why is your, why is your room so empty? Why is there nothing here? And he responds because that is the nature of emptiness. I'm living in emptiness. He very literally says that this is, this is an empty existence, not meaning that we don't have a fullness of the things around us, but the existence that we live in is empty of inherent meaning. That, and so he used, and as you say, that's a, his, the very room that he's in with just a bed to hold him is a metaphor for that idea. So thank you, Joe. Thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Then there follows a discourse on the nature of Shunyata, the nature of his illness. And that goes into what Joe and I were just, were just discussing. 
And after that, Manjushri asks Layman, how should a bodhisattva who was ill go about tempering and controlling his mind? And <clears throat> Bimala Kirti responds, and there's two paragraphs that I'll read. A sick bodhisattva who was ill should think to himself, all these illnesses of mine all spring from the deluded thoughts, the upside down thinking, and various earthly desires of my past existence. They have no real existence. So who is it who suffers illness? Why? The four elements come together, and therefore we apply a makeshift name calling the thing a body. But the four major elements have no master, and the body has no eye or ego. And these illnesses, too, all arise from attachment to ego. Therefore, I should harbor no such attachments to ego. Let me just make a comment about that paragraph first. And that is that in this case, in Buddhism, we recognize five elements. And the four elements that are being referred to in the four elements that are being referred to here are um, earth, water, fire, and wind, which are the not the not the Chinese elements, but the Buddhist elements, which is really interesting. And it, and it brings us back to the notion that this was an Indian sutra, not a Chinese sutra, because the elements in the Indian and the Chinese are, are Buddhism and Chinese are, are different. And also then what he's saying by the four elements is that our bodies are all composed of the earth and water and fire and and wind so that's that's the reference to the to the the four elements once one has understood the origin of illness one may do away with the thought of an eye or ego and the thought of other living beings to do so one should call up the thought of phenomena thinking of oneself it is simply that various phenomena have come together to form this body it has appeared simply because phenomena appear they will vanish simply because phenomena, phenomena vanish. And these phenomena are none of them known to one another. When they appear, they do not say I have appeared. And when they vanish, they do not say I have vanished. And so this is going back to that notion that we were just talking about, that the, the body is of, in and of itself um, merely a provisional vessel and that it has no inherent eternal this about it. That the eye that we refer to in the provisional sense is a provisional eye, and it's not eternal. So it's, it's really discussing the notion of non-self and shunyata. Any, any questions? Yes. yes, please, go ahead. So if you're having a gallstones and a gallbladder and intense pain, uh, that's not, that's really empty. So no, <laughs> no, that's not what he's saying. No. What is he saying? He's saying is There's no that, self that's happening to you? No, he's not addressing all bladders. He's <laughs> saying that your body and your illness that he's addressing is the illness of dukkha. It's attachments, it's ego. That's what he's talking about, right? Okay. So I recently just ate the cause of water. Yeah, right. So when you have when you have a gall, when a person has a gallbladder attack, yes, they have a gallbladder attack. They're not thinking about the ego or the eye, or they think this really hurts. I better do something about it. And the physician is going to heal it. Vimala Kirti is saying that there is no distinction between the mind and the body, and that the mind can be just as in pain as the gallbladder attack. And that's the nature of existence. That's the nature of life. That's what he's saying. Okay. Any questions from the gallery as it were? Yes, Joe. This is a very basic question. Why didn't Shakamuni himself not visit the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have it on I have it on good authority that Shakamana Buddha was busy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <That day. laughs> But we actually, we, we, we address that near the end of the sutra. Near the end of the sutra, we, we have a, 
an idea as to why Shakyamuni Buddha himself didn't go. But remember, he asked all of his you know, disciples and bodhisattvas and such. Um, but that's a good question, you know. I agree. Any other questions? Okay. So the notion of liberation of the bodhisattva is an important element in this chapter. And there's much that I could cite from the chapter in this respect. And I'm going to choose one paragraph in the ongoing response to Manjushri about this. <clears throat> and that is, and I quote, what is meant by bonds? And what is meant by liberation? To become infatuated with the taste of meditation is the bondage of the bodhisattva. To be born in this world as a form of expedient means is the liberation of the bodhisattva. Wisdom without expedient means is bondage. Wisdom with expedient means is liberation. Expedient means without wisdom is bondage. And expedient means with wisdom is liberation. Now, let me just go back a little bit for everyone to say that we normally think that the three pillars of Mahayana Buddhism are prajna wisdom, karuna compassion, and upaya skillful means or expedient means, depending upon how it's translated. And in this case, Vimla Kirti is specifically addressing wisdom and he's addressing Upaya. And Burton Watson makes the following commentary that I'll then go back and discuss this further. In this passion, uh, excuse me, in this passage, wisdom stands for the correct mental attitude of the Bodhisattva in his efforts to lead others to enlightenment. And expedient means stand for the actual methods he employs. The process of liberation or enlightenment is successfully completed only with both attitude and method are correct. And this is something I think that's, that's really important for us to, to tackle. And by that, I mean that in Buddhism, we think of karuna, compassion. We think of prajna as wisdom. And typically when we're sitting meditation, we're doing other practices, that's what we're addressing. Trying to do these in order to encourage, to enhance, to develop compassion, wisdom. Upaya in Mahayana is an extremely, is the third pillar because it's not enough to have the wisdom and the compassion. It's how do you mobilize them? As, as Watson puts it, expedient means without wisdom is bondage and expedient, excuse me, expedient, yes, and expedient means with wisdom is liberation. In other words, having liberation, having wisdom, but not having the paya, the, the skill to use it appropriately is useless. In this case, it's referred to by Bimla Kirti as bondage, meaning that the person isn't able to to do what needs to be done. You need, you need both of these. And, and in fact, this, this entire sutra is devoted more to the idea of wisdom, prajna, and upaya, skillful means, than, and really compassion doesn't enter into it in the same fashion that we see in many other sutra. Um, we, we find that those two things are here. And Yes, go ahead. question. Uh, this means that if you if you meditate, but you don't have the right attitude, then that's useless. Essential. Essential. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think that that's a good way to put it. Um, that meditation without intention, yeah, is is useless. Yeah. Any are there any other questions? before we go on. Back here. Okay. Um, I was gonna say something else about that, now I'm forgetting what it is. I'll move on now, maybe I'll go back. 
Yes, go ahead. It's a written in the first century BCE. Yes. This is around the time of the Wanda. This would have been at the beginning, near the beginning of the Wanda era. Yeah. Would that class of fatuation, the case of meditation, was that in an affecting practice at that time in a way that she was reacting against this time, like five centuries? I, I don't I don't see the, that the way that it's stated here I don't see that being what Chi Yi was responding to reacting to because Chi Yi was reacting to Chan in China in the sixth century as being devoid or being stripped away of the Buddhist practices and become a method without the Buddhist teachings embedded within it Whereas Chan had not entered China by this time. And meditation, I think, was seen in a very different fashion than East Asia with Chan. Meditation was seen as more of a methodology to attain karuna of the compassion and wisdom and that sort of thing. And a way that we read in uh, Athos Goza and, and others as a mechanism by which one could attain wisdom and require discipline. But I think that what's being referred to goes back to somewhat of what Sam was saying is that one has to have the correct meta, meta, mental attitudes in one's meditation. I think that that's what's referred to. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, the next several pages to end the chapter discuss the nature of the bodhisattva. Essentially, he recounts these in many forms. And there's a whole list of these. It goes on for, what, four or five pages, something like that. So I just took a few um, out of, out of the, uh, the many that are there. The realm of birth and death without following its tainted ways to dwell in nirvana while not seeking eternal extinction such is the practice of the bodhisattva. And this is saying specifically, this is, is really essential to the, Maha, to the Mahayana. And that is not seeking eternal extinction. In other words, at the time in the Nikaya Buddhism, Nirvana was the extinction of self. That was it. That was the eternal extinction. And this is saying that's not the bodhisattva path. The bodhisattva path is in the realm of birth and death with, uh, without following its tainted ways, being reborn into samsara, but having the discipline not to succumb to the illnesses, and I'm using the metaphor that, that uh, Vimala Kirti is using, not su succumbing to the illnesses that are inherent in birth and death. And the second one is Though he practices the six paramitas, he can understand the minds and mental activity of all living beings. Such is the practice of the bodhisattva. And here he's really saying that one should be following the six paramitas, which namely are dana, which is generosity, kashanti, which is uh, morality, ethics, virya, which is effort, discipline. Uh, dhyana, which is meditation, and prajna, which is wisdom. And so he's telling us that we should do these things because that's the way of the bodhisattva. And then the last one that I, that I put down is, though he practices concentration and insight as methods to aid one to the way, in the end, he does not sink into tranquil extinction. Such is the practice of the bodhisattva. Sinking into tranquil extinction, one can take to mean something very similar to the previously, previous one, seeking eternal extinction. But tranquil extinction also refers to one has to be proactive. One has to be engaged. One can't just sit back and gaze at one's navel, so to speak. One has to be out in the world, engaging the world. That's what is meant by the um, not sink to into tranquil extinction. And that, by the way, 
Chodin was referring to Rwanda, I think that that was one of the arguments that was going on at Rwanda uh, during that period of time. You had those schools of Buddhism that were eschewing any encounter in the real world. It was, I will become an arhat. I got mine. I'm on my way. The heck with you. <laughs> the other schools were saying, no, no. If, if everyone, if all sentient beings don't attain awakening, then how in the world can you attain awakening? We can only attain it if, if everyone attains it. You have to engage. You have to go out and you have to do something active to assist the benefit of others. And so that's what it's being addressed here. And the last paragraph is when Bimala Kirti spoke these words, 8,000 heavenly sons and daughters in the great assembly led by Manjushri all set their minds on, a on attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, excel perfect enlightenment. And so the inspiration that Bimala Kirti had presented led them all to say, okay, time to get serious here. Let's set our minds to, okay? What questions do we get? I've got time for a couple, couple of questions. Anybody anywhere? <laughs> go, go ahead. I thought uh, somebody uh, was really, uh, the idea of perfect nirvana in the Kaibas. But it but in uh, but in Mahayana Buddhism, it, it also means that if I now am devoting myself to awakening through the benefit of others, and then I too can be awakened. So you have that distinction between Nikaya Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, did somebody uh, who had a question, Ralph? Yes. Um, I've been reading um, uh, this book that you have in your, your site uh, called Foundations of Buddhism by Robert uh, Geffen. Um, and what we were discussing uh, uh, with the idea that body and mind are the same uh, uh, and not the same, connected but not connected or whatever. Um, and I'm thinking, how, would, how does this go ahead and apply uh, to the uh, 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 section on the problem of personal continuity, self as causal connectedness? And, and uh, it, it's, this, it's a section in this particular book that, that uh, I find particularly, especially interesting, because it seems to me that what he's saying is that the self uh, is not something that's permitted or anything like that which we know, but that it is, it is in fact nothing more than just a, a dependent origination, a, 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 a causal connectedness. Yes, it's, it's, just, it's a collective, and actually the, the Vimala Kirti Sutra refers to it as basically a collection of causes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. and, that, and that when we die, the causal connectedness that the self uh, uh, dissolves but the uh, the uh, the uh, um, um, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 potential the uh, the uh, uh, karmic potential uh, goes on to uh, uh, I guess the next being or whatever. Well, what he and what he's talking about in that context is that while the self, um, Ralph is no longer, Ralph ceases to be because that collection of causes is now dissolved. And, and by that, it just means that you as an individual are unique. You know, you had a particular, you were born in a particular place to a particular set of parents, you had siblings or not, you had teachers, you had other people in your life that made you unique to who you are, and that's never going to be reborn. But what continues yeah. on is the karma that you created, um, or not the karma that you created, but the karma that, that has resulted from your actions. Because yes, what I call, 
Yeah, but I call it the karmic potential. The karmic potential would be okay, sure. Yeah. And and the idea is when we when we think about that, I mean, I think that we we sometimes get caught up into a metaphysical discussion about what karma is. Mm -hmm. And I think that we get that from a Western notion of of Judeo-Christian notion of soul and that sort of thing. And and that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is the things that you have done in your life will resonate or not resonate, will have a positive or a negative effect after you are gone in ways that you don't even realize, you couldn't possibly realize at this time. Some people might see it by virtue of the fact that they have children. That continues on. And and there are some Buddhists who argue that that there's a genetic component to that because your child is half of the zygotes of your wife or your partner and yourself, as an example. The other aspect of that is that the things that you've done, maybe you've been a teacher, what happens to the children that you taught What are they going to do in the world? How are they going to react? What is going to happen as a result of that? Right now, we'll be talking about it in a minute. There's going to be a march across a bridge not far from here. And what we do right now is having an effect, whether it's a positive effect or a negative effect, it's up to us on the environment that we live in. That's (laughs) karma. Are we going to do something to, to... continue the destruction of the environment or are we going to do something to try to mitigate the destruction that's taken place already and that to halt further destruct that's karma okay why don't we ask the folks that are here to go on out into no other questions oh i look like you might have had a question okay why don't we ask the people to go on out to the hondo I want to tell you something that I find that, you know, I I mentioned to you before that I have been thinking about several things a lot. And I was specifically talking about uh, the, the issue regarding vaccinations and masks and all that kinds of things and how people are not concerned about other people. And in spite of what, of what Mushin was saying, I think that we have to think about it not only within this lifetime, we have to think about it in future lifetimes. And I think that one of the things that really is uh, significant to me is that we have been living lives that are different than the life that we lived, let's say five years ago. And the life that we lived five years ago, we had certain values and certain ideas that were important. And about two years ago, all those ideas got smashed. We had a pandemic. And this pandemic has caused us to change the patterns of our lives. It's caused us to change our relationships. It's caused us to rethink things like education. It's caused us to rethink things like Sangha. And one of the, the maybe I'll go, go with this from, a, from a, a slightly different perspective. I recognize that much of the news and much of the, excuse me, much of the news that we see is based upon expressing things to get your attention. That's what news does. It expresses it to get your attention. There's a a saying that dog bites man is not a news story. Man bites dog is a news story. (laughs) Man bites dog gets your attention, but dog bites man does not. And so therefore we get stuck into this this, I, this set of ideas about what we should, we should not do, we get alarmed by news, which is necessarily alarming. Um, in many cases, some of the news is blown out of, 
uh, perspective. And so our lives have been really turned upside down in many different ways. And I think that one of the things that we have to keep in mind is something that I might have mentioned previously is that from a Buddhist perspective, change always occurs. What we don't always respect, what we don't always recognize is that change is change. Some change we perceive negatively, some change we perceive positively. But sometimes because of the other influences, such as the news that comes to us and, and uh, the changes as a result of the pandemic in, in terms of not being able to be together as we otherwise might want to be, et cetera, we view that as negatively. And we don't give enough emphasis to the fact that the change that is occurring may very well be good. It may be different. It may change the way we've done things in the past, but that doesn't mean that it has to be bad just because it's different. Right. And we have to learn to embrace the changes that occur as opposed to just condemn the things that are different because they're different. We have to be willing to change with the changes that occur over time. And so from a Buddhist perspective, it's really important for us to keep in mind that every day is an essential opportunity to try something new and to do it again until we do it right. That rebirth is not something that occurs just between lifetimes. It's a, something that occurs within this lifetime and we have to be willing to move with the changes and to make the most of those changes as they occur. And I thank you very much.